as we continue our 40-day journey, first apart but soon together again, let's be called to worship on this second Sunday of Lent. Lent calls us to journey this and every day, following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls us to journey to the place where God covenants with us to receive the new names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together, to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to practice justice, to bring God's hope to all people. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Lent calls each of us to take up our cross, to trust the one who bears it with us. Lent calls us to journey with God. Let us worship God who walks with us this and every day. Good morning, church, and thanks for joining us for online worship this morning. I'm excited to be able to sing together this morning and be able to pray together, to be able to open God's word together and have the Holy Spirit speak to us as we look at God's word and how that applies to our life, that we might be encouraged, that we might be challenged in our walk with Christ to grow and to become more like Jesus. I'm thankful for you joining us today. Thankful for you staying connected during these challenging times. If you hadn't heard yet, I do want to share a piece of good news with you, and that is that this Sunday will be our last Sunday of online only. Starting next Sunday on March the 7th, we will return to basically a hybrid sort of worship model. And that means for those who are comfortable being here in person at the corner of National and Grand and in our sanctuary, you are welcome to come for worship. We worship together at 1030. And for those who aren't yet comfortable coming in person, then you can join us and worship uh, as we share with you a live stream of what's happening here at 1030 on Sunday morning. I'm thankful for your your encouragement and your prayers and your staying connected with God and each other through the times when we have been unable to gather here. And I'm looking forward to worshiping this morning. Let's sing together.
Good morning, UHBC kids, and welcome to Children's Message with Miss Abby this morning. I have a major, most important question to ask you today. Um, have you ever heard the term winning at life? Like hear somebody say, oh my gosh, I am so winning at life. Or maybe using it sarcastically when something bad happens and you're like, hashtag winning at life. Um, that's a term sometimes people use, a type of pop culture that people say. Um, it is not meant to be taken seriously. Sometimes it can be though. Um, and a lot of times if you focus too much on winning, competitive nature comes out. Now I have never been known to be super competitive. Um, my parents put me in a lot of sports as a kid, as you should. Um, I, to this day, don't know how to do soccer or basketball or any type of sport all the way through because, like, I played it for a season. And I was really more like, who's got the Capri Sun and the goldfish? Because I'm just here for the party, you know? So I didn't really um, compete as much as attend games. So winning at life really is not in my category of must-haves, you know, uh, to be competitive. But some people really are, and they're really motivated that way, right? Um, here's what's interesting. The Bible actually points us to ways to, quote-unquote, win at life um, through Jesus. How Jesus allows us to be a winner because of him, not because of anything we've done. Um, so I'm so excited to announce that when you return next Sunday, hey, we will be having children's church upstairs during morning worship. I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm already planning. And because of that, I want to give you the sneak peek and think upon before we get started, what does it mean to be a winner? Because we're going to focus in children's church starting next Sunday. What does it mean to be a winner in Christ. So what does the Bible say about winning? Um, how do we win and how we treat people? How do we win um, in our attitude? How do we win and how we um, talk about God to other people? Um, it's all through the lens of Jesus and it's all through scriptures and stories where people won for the sake of Jesus. And I can't wait to uh, share that with you, to dive deeper in and learn more about that. Um, so as we continue in worship this morning, let's pray and get excited, folks, because Children's Church is a coming. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you now and I thank you for who you are. I thank you for giving us um, the ability to learn on our level um, and to learn um, the Bible in a way that presents who you are and your truth in all ages and all uh, mental capacities and all ways to learn. We're so grateful that we have that ability to do so. Um, that you're allowing us um, time to learn more and invest in who you are so we can go and do likewise to people in the community. Uh, we love you and we thank you for this time in your name. Amen. As we enter into our time of offering this morning, I want to remind you that we are in the season of rolling out of one church here and into a new one. So be watching soon for your proposed budget for the 2021-2022 church year. And we'll also be announcing dates for discussion and for voting on that budget as well. I wanna say a big thank you to the finance board and their hard work in preparing that and adjusting to some changes along the way. And I wanna thank you for your prayers and for your involvement in that process that's coming up over these next few weeks. And as we prepare to give this morning, I want to encourage you to continue to give back to God, to continue to give to his work and his mission in the world. And of course, part of that happens through his local church. And University Heights Baptist Church is one of those. So thank you for continuing to give. May we be spurred on to give to the Lord and to his work in the world. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you have given us. We are so thankful. We are so blessed. And God, we, we just ask that you would remind us, put it on our hearts and our minds, how, how much we truly have to be thankful for. Remind us, Lord, that it's not ours, 
that you have given us the ability to achieve and to obtain and to work and that you have given us these things. And God, we pray that we would see that you're calling us to give back a part of what you've given us for your work and for your mission in the world. We thank you for the ability that you give us to participate in that work. Help us to be cheerful givers. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Heights. Uh, this morning's scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. The church was a block from the kind of town square that made you wish your town had a square. Many of the church members worked in a furniture factory that made gorgeous furniture that was completely and totally unaffordable to them. The pastor really didn't make very much, but the parsonage was filled with beautiful furniture. Not too long into the pastor's tenure, the middle adult Sunday school class, and isn't that an attractive name for a Sunday school class, decided that they no longer wanted to sit in the folding chairs that the church had. And so the class worked out a deal with one of the managers in the furniture factory's chair department. The 14 members of the class would spend $40 each 
that, and, and they would buy the material for chairs that would normally cost about $500. The class members who worked at the factory worked out in this deal that they would go and that they would work on Saturdays and that they would make these chairs. And then the pastor found out that they were making exactly 14 chairs. I'm curious, the pastor asked, couldn't we get some more money together maybe and, and just make a few extra? And their answer was, well, the class only has 14 members. We're the ones who are paying for the chairs and we're doing the work. The pastor naively asked, well, what about when visitors come? He was told, well, we still have folding chairs. And if a member isn't there, they can use one of our chairs. The pastor asked, won't you feel funny sitting in these beautiful chairs while visitors are in folding chairs? The pastor was informed, that's not going to happen. And they were right. Before the new chairs even arrived, the teacher had put a lock on the door so no one else could get in the room. They'd never had a lock on a Sunday school classroom door before, but they explained that they wanted to make sure that their chairs stayed in the room and they wanted to make sure that there were not any kids or youth students who could get in there on Wednesday nights. Several, several years later, the pastor and his wife went back for that church's anniversary celebration. On a Sunday morning when Sunday school was going on, he was walking around looking at the building and reminiscing and looking at how things had changed. And he looked into that classroom on Sunday morning during Sunday school. And that classroom still had 14 gorgeous chairs in the room. But almost all of them went unfilled on Sunday morning. The majority of the class was gone. The teacher had gotten angry and had gone to another church. The young adult class was getting bitter, bigger. The older adult class was doing well, but the middle adults didn't have anybody new. And honestly, what could be less surprising? This is what happens when we keep the best chairs for ourselves. This is what happens when we believe that the church will always be exactly who and what we are right now at this moment or who and what we were at a moment back behind us in time. This is what happens when we limit the kingdom of God. Well, good morning again, church, and thanks for joining us for worship this morning. We wrapped up our sermon series in James, and now we are on our journey to Easter just a few weeks away. This morning, I want us to think about change and, and how the church lives and ministers in the midst of a changing world. The world around us has certainly changed, and it's changing at a more rapid pace than ever before. None of us really like change. We don't jump up and down and get excited about change, and yet <laughs> that doesn't stop the world from changing all the time. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last 25 years, you have probably seen the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. If you haven't seen it, just turn on TBS sometime in the next few days, and it'll probably on because they show it about 37 times a day. In the movie, there is this man, an inmate, that spends almost his entire life in prison. After spending decades in prison, he finally gets paroled, but the world he walked into after he got out of prison has changed from the way that it was when he went into prison. He doesn't know how to operate in this new world. He doesn't know how to live. He doesn't know what to do and with everything that has changed so much since he was last a part of it. The world, people are constantly changing. Today we live in what has been termed a postmodern, post-Christian world. Those aren't words that we normally use, I know, but let me quickly define those. Postmodernism or postmodernity is basically a reaction to the assumed certainty of scientific or objective efforts to explain reality. It denies the existence of ultimate principles and it lacks the optimism of there being a scientific or philosophical or religious truth that will explain everything to everybody. Basically, postmodernity says what is true for you 
isn't necessarily true for me. And what is true for you doesn't have to be true for me. And just because you have said that it's true doesn't mean much because I've had a very different experience than what you have just explained to me. Post-Christian basically means the Christian language and expression and participation that once permeated society, was ingrained into it, and was an integral part of it, has become rare or superficial. If your eyes haven't glazed over and you haven't completely fallen asleep from those scientific definitions, let me take those definitions and show you practically what they look like in everyday life. Church. And Christianity in general does not have the place that it once did in our society and in our culture and even in our community. Sundays are not set aside for church anymore. It's another weekend day. Our culture doesn't set its calendars around Sundays and Wednesday nights, and it doesn't adjust ball games and practices and plays and special events around those days. The phrase the Bible says means no more and maybe less in some instances than any book on any shelf. The new normal for church attendance is just a time or two a month or just a handful of times per year. There was a day and a time in Springfield, Missouri, like most other places in America, that a church on a corner could start. And they could build a building and they could put up a steeple and they could call a pastor and they could put bells that would chime and they could start with just a small handful of people and that small handful of people would draw more people just because it was there. Just because it was there. And that day, that day is long gone. That day is long in the past. For half a century, the American church has been declining. In every, ba in, in every sense, and, and in the very basic sense, if we look around and we pay attention, we, we see that, well, we see that things aren't what they once were, right? We see that things have changed and they've changed dramatically. Right, wrong, or indifferent, the times they are a change in. And crisis, crisis is a revealer. We have been in a year of crisis almost a year of COVID-19, of adjusting our lives, of shutting down and opening up and shutting down again, of not doing certain things, of not going certain places, of, of, of well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't have to tell you what this last year has been, but it's been a year of crisis. And that year of crisis has almost been like draining a lake and seeing what was under the surface of that lake all along, but we had covered it up. We had covered it up with busyness or we had covered it up with uh, cliches and a year of crisis has shown us that we need to deal with that stuff at the bottom of the lake or the stuff at the bottom of the lake will end up killing us. And you know what? We can whine and we can moan and we can complain and we can cry about all the things that have changed in the world and the challenges that it brings to life and the challenges that it brings to the life of the church. Or we can take heart and we can remember that God isn't getting dizzy and falling off of his throne because the world is changing. We can take heart because guess what? The world has changed before <laughs> and it'll change again. And Jesus is still Lord. We can also take heart and be encouraged because the world that we live in, the world that we operate in, the world that we are working to be the church and, and to do church and to, to show the world what the gospel is and to be the presence of Christ in the world, the world that we are doing that in is a lot like the world that Paul lived in when he wrote this letter to the church at Thessalonica. In that world, there was an incredible blending of, of people and cultures, people who were largely living for each moment and whatever felt fulfilling at that particular time without any thought to the long-term effects of what their choices might bring about for themselves or for others or for their families, that they could pick whatever ethos fit them for that particular time and place that they could just reach out their hand and they could they could they could pick whatever 
uh, faith, whatever spirituality they wanted for that particular moment in time or for that particular need in time. That's the world that Paul is writing in, and that's the world that Paul is ministering in. That's the world that Paul is preaching in, very much like our own. They weren't walking around with iPhones. They couldn't call each other. They didn't have Facebook. But the very basics of what that world looked like and what that culture felt like was not very different at all from our own. And in Paul's world, in that world where he writes this letter and his other letters and where he's ministering in the midst of all of that plurality, in the midst of that buffet of religious expression, that's when the church of Jesus really begins to take off and spread and flourish, not not simply in an institutional way, but in a personal revolution of people turning to the hope of the gospel. And so the question for us is, how in the world do we tell this old story of Jesus in a new world? How do we tell an old story in a new world? Then let me preface my answer to that question by saying this. I think that what the Lord uh, taught and teaches us in the book of James that we just finished walking through about what, what James has to say to us about faith is the foundation of how we tell an old story in a new world. And by that, I mean that we tell the story, that we tell that old story with both word and with action, with word and with deed, with words that leave our lips and the things that our hands do. We can't just tell people the good news. We have to make it tangible to them. We have to make it mean something, to be something that they can see and that they can that they can feel. But we also can't just do tangible things and not tell the good news of Jesus. Any club, any service organization can do good things. We have to connect the why to the what. We have to proclaim the message behind the good. We have to join those things together. The word and the deed, we have to join them together like peanut butter and jelly, like, like Tom and Jerry, like hot dogs and baseball. Can't have one without the other or it just isn't very good. How do we do that? How do we, how do we tell people the good news of Jesus, an old story, an ancient story. How do we tell that ancient story in a new world? How do we share that with people? Is it going down to the corner and getting on a soapbox and preaching? Is it buying an Evangicube or going to whatever new canned uh, methodology that they have available at the Christian bookstore? Is it confronting someone? Is it yelling at someone? Is it asking someone, if you died today, do you know where you'd end up? Like me, you have probably seen evangelism or heard of evangelism done really, really terribly. So badly. With emotional manipulation, with backing people into corners and putting incredible pressure on them. And if we're not, if we're not careful we want so badly not to be confused with that sort of evangelism, so badly not, not to even be put in the same conversation like that. If we're not careful, we're so afraid of being seen in that light that telling someone about the hope of Christ almost becomes like a cuss word. But evangelism isn't a cuss word, not a four-letter word. In this passage, we get a glimpse of of, of Paul's method of ministry. And like Paul, I believe true gospel conversations aren't worried with all the right words to say or making sure that we have all of our holes filled in any argument or conversation that we might have. More important than talking with the right emotion, more important than knowing every Bible verse from Genesis to Revelation, more important than any of those things is to have a real caring relationship with somebody. A real caring relationship with somebody. For us to have a gospel conversation with someone, to tell an old story in a new world, it means that the most important thing for us is to know who they are. To know what they're struggling with and what they're celebrating. To know what the needs are in their life. To really genuinely have or be building a relationship with them. And we see that in the life of the writer of our letter this morning. We see that in the way Paul writes uh, to the church, uh, to every church that, that he writes to. 
We see it especially in Paul's letter to the Philippians as he, but he does it over and over and over. We see it in the way that he writes to the young pastor, Timothy. Doesn't mean that he knew everyone for years before he was going to share the gospel with them. And, and often he didn't know them for very long at all. But those people had a sense that this person cares about me and this person cares about me deeply. And, and most of all, we see it in the life of Jesus. We see it in the life of Jesus. People have a sense and an understanding that Jesus isn't teaching them some sort of head knowledge only about God, but that he's teaching them about the inner workings of the human heart and the human spirit, and that he genuinely, deeply cares for them, for who they are, for what they're going through, for the things that they're experiencing, for their joys and for their sorrows, for their fears and for their celebrations, that he genuinely cares for them. But how many, how many relationships if, if telling an old story in a new world starts by building relationships, my next question is, how many, relationship, how many relationships are we really trying to build outside of our bubble? How many relationships are we trying to build outside of our Christian bubble where we're never around anyone who isn't already pretty much like us? where we're never around anybody who sees things differently, who looks at life differently, and on and on. And if we're not careful, pretty soon us church folk can become, well, we can become Pharisees before we even realize that we've done it. And we've decided that we shouldn't be around those folks, that, that, that we shouldn't be seen there, that, that we shouldn't rub shoulders with the people who do those things, <laughs> except that we forget in the midst of all of that that, our Lord Jesus, who we claim to know and to love, was around those people who, who was seen there, who was around people who did those things. So maybe people don't do things exactly like we do. Maybe they operate differently or they make different decisions or they look differently or they live differently. So what? That's life and that's reality. Jesus doesn't sh avoid them. He doesn't shy away from people like that. He doesn't love them any less. Not at all. And we shouldn't either. Over the next few weeks as we approach Easter, we're going to take some time to be silent and still and listen to God on, on a couple of Sunday mornings. But because I, wanna, I want us to think about that. Because if we're not careful... If we're not careful, we busy ourselves with so much, with so much activity, an activity that play, takes place at church, an activity through church programs and in our own Christian bubble that we don't ever have time and that we don't ever have energy to reach past ourselves and past our group and past our own church people to build relationships with people who don't know the hope of Jesus. COVID-19 forced us to slow down. It forced us to give up some things. But I'm really afraid that we're like addicts who are just itching for a hit of that same busyness that revolves around us and that we just can't wait to go back to it. But telling this old story in a new way isn't simply going to happen through church programs and church busyness and in our church bubble. Jesus didn't just hang out at the temple and he didn't just do things with the people who went to the temple. Ministry for the church, for the body of believers, is, it's good and it's great and we should do that. But we don't exist simply for ourselves. We don't exist just for us. We exist as a church, as a body of Christ, not for us, but for the glory of God for his kingdom and for his work and his mission in the world. And there are things that we need to do as a body of believers, like fellowship and study and things which help us grow in Christ, to gather for worship together. But that doesn't mean that we forget about the people around us in Springfield and around the world who don't know the hope of the gospel. In the 1950s, there was a, <laughs> I guess you might call it a rather morbid study conducted by a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He put rats in a container of water and he forced them to swim as long as they could before they drowned. The first round, most of the rats swam for only a few minutes before they gave up hope and sunk to the bottom. 
But in the second round of his study, he made a small adjustment to, to his experiment. Just before the rats gave up and drowned, he would pull them out of the water for a moment and he would put them back in. And after that, the rats would swim for hours. They would swim for hours. One swam for almost an entire day. The difference, according to the scientists, was something that can't be measured. The difference was hope. The rats got a taste of hope. The world we live in has changed, and it is changing all of the time. The world and culture in which University Heights had her brightest days and fullest worship services is no longer the world that we live in. It's not. But here's the thing. Congregations that believe that they can make a difference in the lives of people and in the world around them usually do. And those congregations have that little four-letter word that is so big. They have hope. They have a hope of a future. And guess what? So do we. We have the hope of a future too. Like all churches in a changing world, University Heights has its challenges. But I believe with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind that University Heights has a bright and a vibrant future ahead of us. I believe that we do. Not for my sake. Not for your sake either. Not for the sake of the building, not for the sake of how many people we have in worship, not for the sake of, of survival or the sake of anything else, but for the glory of God. We have hope. And our future, by the way, isn't based on survival. Listen, I don't want to just survive. I don't want us to just survive. That's not living. That's not living at all. Jesus said that he had come, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. I want abundant life. <laughs> I want abundant life for our church. I don't want just to survive. You don't play a game. You don't play a sport just to play the sport. You play to win the game. You play to win. And although the analogy isn't perfect, I don't want to just show up to play church and survive. That's a that's a question that each of us have to answer, by the way, in regards to how we're going to be a follower of Jesus and how we're going to be a member of University Heights. No, do, do we want to survive and simply maintain what we have for as long as we can and hang on for as long as we can? Or do we want to live? Do we want to be fully alive. I want us to live and I want us to be fully alive. I want us to thrive. I want us to soar into the future as a good and healthy church, living the gospel and loving the community and being the church. After leaving office in 1909, Teddy Roosevelt spent significant time hunting in Central Africa and he was touring Northern Africa and Europe giving speeches and like anyone in any leadership position, in any leadership position, at any level at all, he was criticized from time to time, as you can imagine. And in one speech, as he made this tour, he said this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. Church, I don't want to be. I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want us to be a church who sat on the sidelines just making it along. May we dare greatly to tell this wonderful old story of Jesus in a new way.
to be in the arena of life and in the arena of our community, to share this old story in new ways, to live the gospel of Jesus by being his presence in the world, to love our community, to love them well, even those who are different than us. And may we be the church, not by living in a bubble or locking our doors so nobody sits in our chairs, but daring greatly to share the good news of hope and the good news of salvation to a hungry and to a hurting world around us. May we dare greatly with the love of Christ, for the sake of Christ, with the help and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, all for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for this letter that we have and the many letters that we have from Paul that give us a glimpse into who he is and his methodology in terms of ministry and sharing the good news of Jesus. God, we know that we live in a changing world and we know that this last year has been a time of crisis for all of us. And God, we pray that as we seek to live our lives as disciples and as we, as we seek to live our lives as a church family, that we wouldn't be satisfied with just surviving, that we wouldn't be satisfied with existing, that we want to live and that we want to thrive and that we want to soar into the future that you are calling us into. Help us, God, as a church, as people, to tell this ancient story of the good news of Jesus to this new world around us. Help us, God, embolden us. Give us strength when we need it. Give us encouragement when we have fear. Light a fire under us when we become complacent and happy with just making it along. Help us, God, to tell this story of yours to the world around us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.